May I invite you to turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. I will be reading the last two verses of this book, and in the chapter, of course. Mark 16, 19, and 20. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. We are continuing our study in our theme this year, Knowing Christ and Making Him Known. And so the different themes and topics that we will be considering on Sundays, unless there are special occasions, will be based on this overall theme. And I hope that uh, what you have learned thus far from the beginning of the year has been very helpful to you. And I have decided that we will use that even in our study in one of the Bible studies I lead, so that even there we will be able to challenge ourselves, you know, to encourage ourselves to make sure that the desire of God for you and me be realized, that we will know Him more and then make sure we will make Him known to others. Now, the Bible reveals that there are five main events that are connected to the person and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And these five events are so interconnected that if you disregard one of them, the others will be held insignificant to a certain degree. And the five events are the following. First of all, his incarnation or his coming into this world as a human being. We celebrate that as Christmas. The second event is his crucifixion. And we celebrate that as Good Friday. The third one is something that happened three days after he was crucified, and that is known as the resurrection from the dead. The fourth one is the one we'll be talking about, which is known as the ascension, and the last one is his second coming again. So in a sense, these are five red-letter days in the calendar of God. Now, I, I, I realize that we give so much importance to the first three, that the fourth one is, in a sense, overlooked. I mean, we, we, we celebrate a big deal Christmas Day, December 25th. We have a celebration of Good Friday. I mean, it's always done every year. And then when Easter comes around, you know, I mean, there's such a lot of, of, of activities and events that, that somehow we think that that is a very important thing. It is. Please don't misunderstand me. And so what has happened is that the ascension has been overshadowed by Christmas and it has been outshone by Good Friday and Easter. That we have really no, no sense of understanding what it is all about. Now, I want to let it be known to you that although the ascension doesn't get a lot of coverage, whether in biblical narrative or in pastoral preaching or teaching, it doesn't mean to say, though, that it is less important or insignificant than the others. As a matter of fact, in some countries, they celebrate the big deal. For example, in Greece, on Ascension Day, all the banks are closed. They don't have any kind of work, and so they celebrate it. I mean, somehow, to them, this is something very important. There is a, a, a town in Spain that on Ascension Sunday, they will actually put up a huge cross on the steps of the cathedral there, and then they will fasten that with red flowers and celebrate the whole day, the Ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, perhaps what you were wondering, why don't we do that, Pastor? Well, most of the time, Ascension Sunday takes place on a weekday, not on a Sunday. And so perhaps pastors and even Christian leaders will overlook that. But I don't want to do that because as we are going to know more about Jesus Christ, we will know more about this important event in his life. Now, although the references are scant, we know this fact, that the ascension took place 40 days after the resurrection. 
If you turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. This is the second book written by Luke. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. It says, To whom he also presented himself alive, after suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then look at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. And then go down the verses, and you will see this. Verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, that is what happened. He ascended 40 days after the resurrection. Now, people are asking the question, why 40 days? Why not after 30 days? Well, I really have no answer for that. There is no biblical, actually, answer that will satisfy our curiosity. But do you remember that before Jesus Christ actually began his ministry, he was actually in the desert for 40 days? And he was tempted by the devil? Remember that story? So there is actually some significance to the number 40. And somehow, when Jesus Christ was risen from the dead, and for the next 40 days before he went back to heaven, the Bible says that he was actually showing himself to his disciples and to every one who followed him in a way that they would know that something had happened. Now, by the way, I want you to understand that the ascension is not just a New Testament truth. There is actually an Old Testament prophecy. We read that in Psalm number 24. In verse 7 to 10, we read, Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he? This King of glory. The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. That is actually the prophecy of the ascension. And so in other words, the Old Testament was preparing even us for that. And the apostle Paul emphasizes in Ephesians 4, 8, that when Jesus ascended up on high, he had led captives, captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So there is value to this event. There is value not only doctrinally, there is value not only spiritually, there is value even practically. Now, Robert Ramsey, a Bible commentator, said this, Easter is incomplete, Pentecost is impeded, and the second coming is impossible without the ascension of Jesus Christ. Did you get that? Easter is incomplete. Even if he arose from the dead, if he didn't go back to heaven, that's useless. And Pentecost would be impeded because he will still be here and could therefore not send the Holy Spirit. And of course, because he's still here, there can be no second coming. You understand? So you get the, the impression here of how important and significant this event is. But what does it speak about Jesus? What does it speak to you? What are the implications of the ascension of Jesus to us and to our ministry? Now from the passage that we read, we learn three important things. So, knowing Christ, the Lord who is ascended in heaven. First of all, you will know that he is the Lord who is alive. He is the living Lord. Now look at verse 19. He says, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them. Now, you think, what's the value of their pastor? Well, if he was dead, he couldn't be speaking, right? If he were still in the grave, he wouldn't be speaking. But the Bible says, Mark records that as he was still speaking, he was slowly raised up to heaven. That is what we see here. You see, the context of the passage, as well as in other biblical texts, shows to us that Jesus was, as I've said a while ago, revealing himself to his disciples. Revealing himself as what? Revealing himself as alive, not dead. He was a living Lord. 
See, from the day he arose from the dead to the time he went back to heaven, he proved himself alive in many infallible proofs. They could not disprove that. In other words, while he saw them or while they saw him, they could know and they could understand this is not just a ghost. This is not just a spirit. This was not just a phantom. This was not a specter. This was a Lord who was living physically. As a matter of fact, one time he said to them, do you have any food there? See, if he were a ghost, he could not eat. Give me something to eat, he said. And so what the point is this, that Jesus, when he was raised to heaven, he was not actually in a coffin. He was not inside Actually, a, 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 a set of cloths, just like what they do when they bury the dead. In other words, he was not risen or he was not ascending as a dead person. He was actually vertical when he went up. You understand? He was alive, the Bible says. And when he was taken from the disciples' presence, it was a living body that ascended before him. If you turn to Luke 24, Luke 24, 50, 51. I want you to notice again here the manifestations of this living Lord. Now it came to pass when he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. You notice what he was doing? He was blessing them. And blessing is the act of a living person. A dead man cannot bless you. You understand? A dead person cannot pronounce blessing on you. Only a living one. And this is what happened. And the Bible says in Mark 16, 19, that he was received up into heaven. Now, the word receive here implies a welcome given to a hero with pomp and circumstance, glorious and victorious. Now, listen, if Jesus were ascended to heaven dead, how in the world can he welcome or can he receive this kind of welcome? It will not be with pomp and circumstance. It will not be with joy and rejoicing. It will be with tears. I mean, we, we see that all the time. You know, every time a, a, a Canadian soldier is repatriated, uh, you've heard the word repatriation? I mean, somebody dies in Afghanistan, somebody dies in Iraq, they are repatriated. In other words, the process of sending back that person to his origin. And of course, when they do that, that person is inside a coffin. And they put him inside a hearse, and people line up the 401, giving tribute to a fallen soldier. This is a sad thing, right? But that is not what happened to Christ. The angels were not weeping. The angels were not crying. They were thinking, no, he's a living God. And that is the kind of God we are, the kind of Savior we have. I remember, I was, I don't know how, I was my, my first year in the pastorate. You remember, those of you who are old enough, that in 1969, the first men went to the moon, right? You know those, those men were? Neil Armstrong and Aldrin. And when they came back to earth, they were actually acknowledged as heroes. And you know what they did to them? They gave them what they call a ticker tape parade in Manhattan. I mean, they were actually placed in, in cars with the, with the tops down and then uh, tons of confetti were actually thrown from the high rises in Manhattan. They were hailed as heroes. They were hailed, you know, as men who had actually crossed the boundary, so to speak. The final zone or the final space, they said. And listen, that is nothing in comparison to what Jesus received when he got to heaven. I mean, could you just imagine the resounding shout and the singing of the angels and of the host in heaven? When they welcomed the Son of God, hey, we missed you. For 33 years, he was gone from heaven. Now he's back, alive, no longer a baby, but one who is forevermore to be with them. But what is the application here? Simply this. Remember John 14, where Jesus Christ said, because I live, you too shall live. I know most of us look at that verse and think of it as a prophecy. Yeah, pastor, I know that. I know that if I die one day because Jesus lives, I too will live, right? That's true. That's a prophetical truth. But listen. This is also a practical truth. In other words, because he is alive now, you too can be living that kind of life that is powerful. You understand? I mean, you just don't wait until the time, okay, I'm going to die, but I'm going to wait until he will take me out of that grave. No, right now we can live that life that is as powerful as Jesus' was today. 
You know what he says? Galatians 2.20. What did Paul say? Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you he made alive. Listen, you're thinking, Pastor, I'm alive. I'm a walking man. I'm an eating man. I'm a laughing man. I do this. I do, I'm alive. Listen, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the spiritual life. You see, when you accepted Christ as your Savior, He gave you that new life in Christ, and now that kind of life is being expressed. How do you do that? If you read Ephesians 5, you walk in love. You walk in light. You walk in wisdom. You walk according to the will of God. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Our risen Lord, our ascended Lord is a living Lord. And because of that, we too are going to manifest that kind of life today. Sometimes we're like Lazarus. I mean, we are already risen, but you know what? We cannot move. You know why? Because we are still surrounded by cloth. And you know what Jesus Christ said to them? Lose him and let him go. I mean, do you understand what I'm talking about here? You see, in those days, there were no coffins. There were no, no, no wooden coffins for them. They would just simply wrap the dead person and then throw that into a cave or somewhere else. And that's what happened to Lazarus. He was inside a cave, wrapped in cloth. And when he stepped out of the tomb, Jesus Christ said, lose him, set him free. And this is what God is trying to say. I am alive, and you too have been made alive. Now I want you to be free from that, he says to you. And that is the practical implication of the truth of the ascension. The ascended Lord is a living Lord. And because he lives, we too should be living right now. I, I wonder, let me ask you this question. Are we walking corpses spiritually? Or are we dynamic? Are we excited? Are we on fire for Jesus too? Are we living, so to speak? The second truth I want you to notice is in verse 19b. Let's go back. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven. Now remember what it means? He was welcomed enthusiastically. He was welcomed with gusto. He was welcomed, you know, with pomp and circumstance. All the music of heaven would have been just wonderful and fantastic. But then look at the next verse. And sat down at the right hand of God. Now, by the way, this is an anthropomorphic language that expresses God's supreme majesty, might, and authority. When Jesus Christ was brought up to heaven on his ascension day, God the Father welcomed him and said, Son, take your place. What was the place? The right hand of God. And so what we see here is not only the Lord who is alive, but also the Lord who is authoritative. The Lord who has power and majesty. The Lord who has pomp and authority. Now, this phrase, right hand of God, is found 31 times in the entire Bible. And that signifies a place of power and preeminence. Now, I want you to understand this, beloved. Jesus Christ did not go up to heaven usurping an authority that does not belong to him. No. It was his when he left it 33 years before. Remember when he prayed in John 17, he said, Lord, I have now completed your work on earth. Now please bring me back to where I was. That was his prayer, right? He was ushered to his throne. In other words, the ascension was the enthronement and coronation of Jesus Christ. We're not going to wait for that yet. He is already crowned. He is enthroned already. He is the God with authority, with power, with majesty. In Psalm 110, verse 1, we read, The Lord said to my Lord. Now, actually, there's an interesting change of words there. The Lord is Adonai, or Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand. In other words, before he even came down to this world, that was already being manifested and shown. Again, in John 17, 5, Jesus prayed, O my Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In other words, let me repeat what I said. At his ascension, Jesus was not usurping authority. 
He was receiving it as properly belonging to him. I, I hope we understand this point, folks. Jesus Christ is not a servant in heaven. He's the one issuing the decrees and edicts and commands. And the Bible says that the angels in 2 Peter, if you read it please, 2 Peter chapter 3.22, he actively rules with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. They're not trying to say, hey, you just came here a while ago. What are you trying to do? You're showing who you... No, he was ruling because that was his. You understand? You know, there's a problem with us today. Many times we forget that Jesus is our master. That Jesus has the authority. Remember when he said in Matthew 28, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go. Therefore, make disciples. Therefore, do this in my behalf. Let's not forget that. And that is the implication of this truth today. Are we submissive? Do we acknowledge him as our king, as our ruler, as our master? I mean, somebody said, you know, too many times Christians say, no, Lord. You see, said, these two words should never come together. If he is Lord, then there can be no. It will all be, yes, Lord. I mean, we submit to that authority. And this is what he is today. He is the one sitting on the right hand of the Father. You remember Saul, the first king of Israel? You know why the Lord actually rejected him? According to 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 31 and 32, or 13 and 14, it says, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord. In other words, he did not obey the word of the Lord. Because he thought, well, I'm king now. Why should be obeying him? And so God said, because of this, I'll reject you. And that's what happened. And you know, too many times we think, no, I don't need to be obedient. This is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. If he is really Lord of my life, then what do you do when he tells you to do this? And say, Lord, I don't like that. I'm not going to follow that. Oh, Lord, I like this one. I'll do this. No, you can't choose your... It is not like some kind of a smorgasbord, you know, that you, okay, I'll get that, I'll get that. I'll... No, no. What he says, we will do. And I know it's a struggle. It's a challenge. He wants us to be prayerful. But we say, but God, I don't have the time to do that. He wants us to get ourselves into the book, and into the word, and he says, Lord, I don't have the opportunity to do so. He wants us to serve him and say, but God, I don't have the gift. I mean, all the time there is some kind of an excuse given by us somewhere, somehow. Lord, I'm sorry I cannot do this simply because of this. And listen, if he is Lord, if he is king, what do you do? There was a man, you know, who, who appeared and was actually welcomed by, by the king of France one day. And uh, he said, will you come and join me tomorrow for dinner? And uh, the next day, the king was surprised to see that man. He actually invited. He said, why are you here? And the man said, well, you invited me yesterday. And the king said, but you didn't say yes. And the man said, I don't have to say yes, you are king. That's so why he obeyed you. And I mean, that makes sense, right? If the king says, come, you come. You just don't say, okay, I'll come. No, you don't say no. But that's the problem with so many us Christians. We know he's alive. We know he's authoritative. But somehow we say, no, I don't want to. And somehow one day we will stand before him and you try to start giving that account of your inability to do it and you give excuses and God says to you, sorry, doesn't make sense. It doesn't hold water. I hope you understand today. That's as you think of your Lord as the one who is seated now there on the right hand of the Father and he says to you, do this for me and say, sorry, Lord, I can't. One day you will have to give account of that. The ascended Lord is not only the Lord who is alive, but also the Lord who is authoritative. Are we going to say no to what he says to us today? Finally, you look at verse 20. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Interesting. The ascended Lord, who we should know, 
It's not only the Lord who is alive. The Lord who is authoritative is the Lord who is active. I mean, he's seated, but he's not idle. You understand? See, when you think of a man who is seated, especially think of a man who is seated, you know, on a sofa, what does he do? Maybe you think of yourself. You come home from work, you're tired, you get your slippers, you sit in the sofa. You know what you hung into? What are you holding on to? That remote control. And you sit there and simply, I don't like that. Flip. I don't like that. You know, I mean, you're sitting and you're idle. You know nothing except using this. This is the only active part of your body. Maybe the eyes too. And you know, when Jesus went up to heaven, he didn't simply sit down there and do nothing. He was doing something. He was active. Now look at the verse again. It says here, And they went out and preached everywhere the Lord working with them. I love that. Although the sacrifice for sin is complete, his presence and power provide the motivation and the joy and the willingness to go and proclaim the truth in the world. And as they did that, the Lord was with them. He actually said, I'll be with you, I'll take care of you, and I will confirm what you're doing. First of all, Jesus is active on earth. He is here right now through the Holy Spirit whom he sent down when he ascended. And what does he do? Number one, he works with us. He worked with his disciples. You know, it's an amazing thing. Think of those 11 guys, men who were like rats, hiding into their own little corner because they were afraid of the Jews. But when Christ ascended and when Christ resurrected from the dead and showed to them he was alive and went back to heaven, all of a sudden there was a change in the decorum of those men. There was no more fear. Even think of Peter, who was being challenged by the Sanhedrin. You are not going to preach anymore. You said, we would rather obey God than man. What happened here? Because this ascended Lord was working with them and in them. As they went out and preached everywhere, Jesus was with them. And not only that, he was confirming the word. And you know, this is what I love about. Maybe I don't see the miracles I want to see in lives of people. But you know what? God still honors his word. Sometimes he may not honor the one who gives the word. But listen, he will always honor his word. Because I can be unfaithful. I can be careless with my life. But praise God, his word will always be true. And he will honor that. It's just amazing what he can do in you when you respond to the word. Because Jesus is confirming that even in the lives of those who listen to it. You know, I remember I was preaching in, I was preaching in Chicago some time ago. And it was their camp. And as you know me, when I preach, I gave my heart out. I preach, you know, with that kind of, of, of passion that God has given me. And after my message, I gave an invitation, and there were two people who accepted the Lord as their Savior that day. You know, after the message, after the, all, everything was done, somebody came to me, he was actually studying at Wheaton College, and he told me, you know, Pastor, if you preach that message in my city, in, in the Philippines, I think maybe 20 people will say, oh, have been saved. And I thought, really? I'm not sure about that, because I'm not the one controlling that. But the point is this. He said it was so preached in a way that perhaps nobody can say no to it. But you see, only God can touch hearts, not me. But he uses the word to do that. Do you understand? He uses his word, and he confirms that by people responding and people knowing what to do with their lives. And this is what happened when Jesus Christ went to heaven. Uh, remember the promise he made, you shall do greater things than I have done. You know, I've always been, I've been intrigued by that passage. You shall do greater things than I have done. You know why? Because they are now all over the world. So there is that extensiveness. But then listen, I have the Holy Spirit in me. And so the work becomes intensive. You understand? He becomes the power behind my ministry. And this is what is happening now. The Lord is active here on earth, but listen, he's also active in heaven. What does he do? Number one, he prays for you. I love that. He is our intercessor. I told you, God has given me the opportunity to be your pastor. And one of the things I committed myself when I became your pastor almost 26 years ago, 
I said, I'll pray for you individually and as families. I, I don't want to, to use that, you know, as a, as, a, as a token of being prideful. No, I don't, I don't mean that. That should be my ministry, right? I mean, you should expect your pastor to pray for you. What happens if I don't? And you say, you don't deserve that ministry, pastor. You don't even care about us. Because if there's one thing that I as a pastor can do you for more than any other thing, maybe even better than preaching, it is to pray for each one of you. Well, I want to tell you this. There are moments when I can't. There are moments when I forget. There are moments when I'm sick. But I want to tell you this. There is somebody who will never miss praying for you. And that's Jesus. He's active right now in heaven praying. Oh, I love that poem. He prays for me. He prays for all of us. Isn't it an amazing thought? I mean, we can forget the brothers and sisters we're supposed to be praying for this week. And some of you, thank God you do that every day. And I appreciate you. I thank you for your willingness to be involved in this ministry. But even when we fail in this aspect, listen, Jesus will never fail us. Well, what is he doing? You see, he's a high priest. He's our intercessor. He understands what you go through. He says, you know what? Hey, listen, I've been there. I understand you. I care for you. Hang on to this. Even if the whole world fails us, my Jesus, our Jesus will never fail us. But the second thing that I want you to notice is this. He's preparing a place for us in heaven. Jesus is an architect. He's a builder. I wonder what kind of home he's preparing for you and me. Um, are, you, are you excited about that? You know, we've been living in the same the same house or the same residence now for the past 21 years. And many years before, people would say, Pastor, why don't you find another house? Why don't you go somewhere else? And I thought, no, we're comfortable where we are. We love our place. You know, even Lorna sometimes says, uh, even our, our children say, why don't we just leave and go somewhere else? And my, my wife would say, no, I love this place. It may not be the best one, comparatively speaking, but you know what? I don't care. There's something better that is awaiting me in heaven. I tell you, I don't even have to pay mortgage for that. <laughs> Jesus already has paid it for it, for us. You understand? I'm not going to be waiting for a place where I say, God, can I afford this? And God says to you, no, you can't. But Jesus paid it all. And he's preparing that place for you and me now. And when he has prepared, the Bible says in John 14, I will come again. Oh, what a blessed thought this is. My home is preparing, is being prepared for me in heaven. But my question is this. I mean, you, you are listening to me. Are you sure you'll have a home there? Well, I hope so. You'd say no. You can really be assured when you say, Lord, thank you that you're my Savior. Thank you that you died on that cross for me. Thank you that you have risen from the dead for me. Thank you that you're now ascended in heaven for me. And thank you one day you're coming for me and you are going to bring me to the place that you have prepared for me. Oh, listen, folks. Because he is active for us, what is the challenge? Are we going to be, okay, Lord, do it, right? It's just like this. You get married, and then after the marriage, you sit down and say, okay, why do something for me, make me happy. And you sit down there. No, you don't do that. You do your thing so that your wife will be happy. Your wife will make things so that you will be happy. And you work together. And this is what Christ says. When he saved you, he said, I'll give you gifts because I want you to be useful for me. And so Jesus Christ says, work while it is day. Be active. First Corinthians 15, 58 says what? Huh? We are challenged by this passage by Paul, and we will be closing. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When you do something for Christ because he has asked you to do it for him, he who is active for you now will one day come and says, well done, good and faithful servant. We can't afford to be apathetic, right? We can't afford to be lethargic and complacent. You know, I read a story of a bank in Binghamton, New York. And 
they sent a floral arrangement to a business that had actually moved to their new building. But there was a mix up in the florist shop. And so the card and the arrangement that was sent to this business with a new location read something like this, with our deepest sympathies and condolence. And so when, when, the, when the owner of the company got that, they called up the florist. And so the florist apologized. But he became even more embarrassed when he learned that the floral arrangement for that building was sent to a family grieving at a funeral home. And the card read, congratulations on our new location. <laughs> you know, that seems a little bit funny, but listen. You can send that floral arrangement to Jesus now and say, congratulations, you are now on your new location. But you know what? He's not going to stay for good. He's coming down again to take you and me to be with him. What a day that is going to be. Are you prepared for that? Are you ready?